Erev Tov, Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live and the title on your screen and behind me, Syrian Refugees Prelude, the Coming of the Two Witnesses. That may sound outlandish, but I think after you see what I'm about to share with you, it may have a lot of reality to it. Uh, anyway, guys, uh, it is a little bit different motion tonight. We're going more into a prophetic look at the events that are happening, especially that in Syria. Going to be looking pretty deep into that. And by the way, we did on our Facebook page posted a news report that we had shared with us. Can't say that it's so or not, but supposedly inside sources from the Pentagon are have it's been leaked out that they've got 72 hours to down a Russian jet to see if they can get Russia provoked into war. Well. We'll just have to wait to see if that really comes to pass or not. I did read the article, looked at to it pr pretty seriously there. I can't say yay or nay. I know that right now the Obama administration certainly is pulling its straws, running out of time, nearing election time, so it may, may come to be, to be so. Anyway, let's get right into this. I want to share with you, this is just uh, scenes here. Uh, a little bit of an older scene right here that you see here. This was the Syrian conflict in, in, in an earlier stage of it there. The infighting, the rebels fighting with one another, the ISIS fighting, the Syrian army fighting, uh, Russia finally coming to the aid of Mahmoud Abbas, uh, not Mahmoud Abbas, but uh, Bashar al-Assad. Uh, and then we end up with a huge major refugee crisis. Uh, much worse than what it is now on your screen here in the beginning and only got worse and worse as time went on. Finally, all these refugees ending up in Europe, the United States. Uh, they say some are in Turkey, but I think most of the ones that are in Turkey are now in um, Germany. But uh, millions of people have been displaced and it is prophetic. I have shared that with you. I've taken you uh, through several places biblically that this is prophetic events that have been happening. But what comes after this refugee crisis in Syria, and not just Syria, northwest Iraq as well, when we get around Nineveh, we find that in the book of Nahum also happening right about the same time as that of the Syrian crisis here, it could be the coming of the two witnesses. There may be a very interesting passage. I shared a little bit with you the other day. Going to go a little deeper into that tonight, mainly because when I hit the part about Moses, well, that just kind of gets everybody excited. Everybody is already kind of prefixed on Elijah and Enoch. Well, Enoch may come back just as well, too. Who knows? Well, for that matter, maybe all the disciples will be here as well. I mean, there's many people believe in a resurrection, and I do as well. So, yeah, I believe all of them will be back at some point or another, uh, right here before the millennial reign gets started. So, uh, but that's not what we're hitting on. Tonight, we want to talk about the two witnesses, but I'm going to take you in a direction here to kind of settle some of those issues as well. Let's take a look first at what I'm talking about, though, as far as the scriptures being fulfilled, especially in the case of the refugees in Syria. Micah chapter 7, the title here, notwithstanding the land shall be desolate because of them that dwell therein. It's exactly what's happening in, as we read here, us Syria, which is modern day Syria and northwest Iraq. So that's what's so fascinating. Both areas are encompassed, both areas are affected, and biblically, that's what it speaks about. Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy, when I fall, I shall arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. Okay, now, I put a little notation in here. This is a message to the Assyrians and to Adam. When Micah records this here, Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. Israel, letting you know through the prophecy all the way back to Micah, even though the Assyrians, originally, they went against the house of Israel, the northern kingdom. Ten tribes dispersed them throughout all the entire earth. Later, Esau's descendants, according to the book of Obadiah, come against the house of Judah. 
but he employs the Syrians in order to help him in his battle against the house of Judah to siege the temple and destroy Jerusalem. And as Yeshua said, not one stone would be left upon another. It has nothing to do with the Temple Mount. It was the temple itself Yeshua spoke about. And sure enough, not one stone is left upon another. Won't be long, I'll be going to Israel again here. I'll be meeting with Brother Roddy there, doing a special broadcast on exactly that third temple. Where they're going to try to put it at, where the first and second temples set at. Be an interesting broadcast, I'm sure you'll enjoy. Anyway, no, let's continue on. Verse 9, I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he plead my cause and execute judgment for me. You know, my rabbinical brethren, let me just say something to you here right now. You, we could learn a lot from Micah. Anytime Israel has ever been dispersed as a nation, it's always been because of our sins. Okay, so when Micah starts off, rejoice not against me, O mine enemy, He's speaking about Assyria, Syria, and, of course, Esau's descendants, Edom. He says, I shall arise when I sit in darkness. The Lord shall be, my, be a light unto me. That's right. The Lord was a light unto him. and has been a light to Israel all the way through her time of darkness while being exiled from her homeland. But watch what he says here in verse 9. I will bear the indignation of the Lord. And we have borne that indignation of the Lord because what? Because I have sinned against him. We didn't get dispersed in 70 AD because we were so righteous and because our sacrifices were so pleasing unto God. Maybe we ought to sit back and rethink that a little bit. Look at what the prophets had to say, what Isaiah had to say, what Jeremiah had to say. I'm not saying that God didn't allow and permit a sacrificial system but the point is as God said he would rather have mercy and judgment not the way you ended up letting it go so we are dispersed because of our sins till he plead my cause and execute judgment for me notice what he says he will bring me forth to the light that's the Mashiach and I shall behold his righteousness. Not our own righteousness, his righteousness. Verse 10, then she that is mine enemy shall see it, and shame shall cover her which said unto me, Where is the Lord thy God? Mine eyes shall behold her. Now shall she be trodden down as the mire of the streets. Israel, let me say something to you right now. And I, and I have seen the remarkable video. I shared it here on Israeli News Live's Facebook page there. Remarkable video there of the Israeli IDF uh, medic forces evacuating injured, bombed out, burned up victims from Syrian lines and everything, taking them in and treating them. But yet at the same time, God has said, she that my enemy shall see it, and shame shall cover her, said unto to me, Where is the Lord thy God? Mine eyes shall behold her. Now she shall be trodden down as the mire of the streets. Wasn't it Assyria that first drove the house of Israel into exile? You see, God brings back judgment. See, he says right there, Mine eyes shall behold her. Now she shall be trodden down. In the day that th thy walls are to be built, in that day shall the decree be far removed. Now, I'm not really sure what he means by that. In the day that thy walls are to be built. I, I'm really looking into that. I I'm prayerfully want to see what that is. I haven't searched it either, but I'm prayerfully looking at that. In that day also he shall come even to thee from Assyria and from the fortified cities and from the fortress even to the river and from sea to sea and from mountain to mountain. All right, that's an invasion, guys, an invasion. Notwithstanding the land, what land? Assyria. Shall be desolate because of them that dwell therein for the fruit of their doings. You know, that. this reminds me of the times uh, when Elisha was here. 
Some of the things that happen, you know, they come looking for Elijah. He said, come here, I'll show you right where he is. Let him right into the battle of the enemy. And they got, they got just tore all up. <sighs> Decimated, that is. Tore all up. If you use that in translation, it's an idiom. That means that they were destroyed in battle. Um, so the land is desolate because of their own doings. What land? The land of Assyria. The land of modern-day Syria and northwest Iraq. That encompassed the Assyrian em Empire. And they have allowed, like o the Obama administration, who is supposedly a Muslim as well, has gone in there, armed up a bunch of Syrian people, rebels and everything else, give them all kinds of weapons to go in there to topple Bashar al-Assad. And so they've created a civil war of their own doing because of what? Hey, you want a little money? I don't know what all it is for, but for some reason or other, you're willing to do it and kill each other along the way. All right, now that's what God does. God sets the stage. God, through his prophet Micah, prophesies not only that our people would be dispersed, which this here, we've already been dispersed when Micah reads this right here, but that we would be in dispersion because of our own sins and that, that we would be brought to the light. See? He, sh he will bring me forth to the light. Wow. He, that he, watch that he right there. Now you're going to find out who the he is will bring me forth to the light and I shall behold his righteousness. God's got a guy in mind to bring Israel to the light. Maybe it's an unfinished job. Let's take a look. Has Moses returned is the question that's being asked here. My question anyway. Micah verse 14 in chapter 7. We continue on. Feed thy people with thy rod, the flock of thine heritage, which dwell solitarily in the wood in the midst of Carmel. Let them feed in Bashan and Gilead as in, the, as in the days of old. According to the days of thy coming out of the land of Egypt, will I show unto him marvelous things. Who's the him? Guys, the him is the he that's going to lead them to the light. Let me find it. See? He shall lead me, right there, judgment. He will bring me forth to the light. Well, now that he shows up over here, in verse 14, feed thy people with thy rod, the flock of thine heritage. See? Verse 15, And according to the days of thy coming out of the land of Egypt will I show unto him marvelous things. Now it's kind of referring back to the time of Moses. Verse 16, The nation shall see and be confounded at all their might. They shall lay their hand upon their mouth, their ears shall be deaf. Hmm. Interesting, isn't it? Let me, let me break some of this down for you. Those of you that haven't joined our Hebrew classes on my wife's channel yet, you can join, because I'm actually going to go, this is going to be our third lesson, and we're going to take a look at some of this right here. Yod Dalet is the verse 14 in chapter 7 of Micah right here. Ro'e amcha betecha. All right? If you do the word ro'e, ro'e is like a shepherd that is leading his sheep. So when we have on there, feed thy people with thy rod, the flock of thine heritage, okay? Zion nachalatecha. All right, the Zion is the flock. Zion is like a flock of, uh, uh, of sheep or goats, whatever you want to have. But this is very difficult to translate. They translate it to feed thy people with thy rod, but it's more like leading your people with your staff. Now, it doesn't use the word mate. Mate is the word staff that God uses for Moses there. But the reason it doesn't is because of this root right here. Shabbat. Shabbat right here, or Shabbat, is a very interesting word. It can be used as rod as well, like a staff, a stick. But it's also because it is a family, it's a family issue. Where was Moses' rod? Where did it end up? Aaron took the rod. Aaron took, placed it in the ark. It budded and blossomed, bare almonds all in one day. Okay, right? We know the story of that. So it becomes a family type of rod. It's a rod of heritage. 
So here this guy comes, he's going to lead Amcha, your people, it's a singular guy, that's the he back earlier, and what's he doing? With that rod, of the family rod of the heritage, you're going to take, you're going to, you're going to, it doesn't literally say the word feed, but you're going to, you're going to pasture your, your flock. You know, when I saw this, when God revealed it to me, suddenly in my heart, I saw Moses standing at the Red Sea with that rod in his hand and the ocean parting in front of him. And I know that was the Gulf of Aquaba too. Ron Wyatt was right about that. Well, no matter what people think about the man, he was right about what he said there. And what God led him, I believe God led that man there. All right, so watch what happens. So he does. So we get this guy, one man standing there. He's leading your people. All right, feed your, feed, I'll just use the way KJV used it here. Uh, you can say lead your people is probably more correctly. Feed thy people with thy rod. The flock of thine heritage which dwell solitary in the wood. All right, so he goes back in Egypt and everything. Verse 16 again. The nation shall see and be confounded at all their might. Okay, they, uh, excuse me. Irau goim. See, so all the nations see this. They see what happens. And they shall lay their hand upon their mouth and their ears shall be deaf. Can you imagine when Moses picks up that rod and holds it up again and the thunder that will strike the entire earth and it must strike the entire, something happens guys. I'm talking about supernatural is what I'm talking about is going to happen because all the nations are confounded at their might. Now the question is, is I've looked at this pretty deep, even in the Hebrew right here, at their might and it, whether God is referring to the might of the two witnesses now referring to them in the plural or is it speaking of in other words no matter what the might is of the nations themselves that's the way I kind of perceive it at their might you know in other words is regardless of how much military strength they have with nuclear bombs and everything else they see from the from some kind of undoubtedly a thunderous type of noise because their ears shall be deaf and they see it. They see what? They see what? They see this guy shepherding Israel with a rod? All right, let's back up just for a moment here. Gonna, gotta, gotta get to the reason why we're talking about this issue here. We're gonna come right back to it because the whole point is, is I see God speaking about one of those two witnesses, Moses, coming on the scene, fulfilling prophecy. And we're going to get into that in a moment, too, a little deeper, that has not been fulfilled by Moses ever. Okay? But let's first know that we have two witnesses that are coming. I will give power unto my two witnesses. Revelation 11, 1, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, say, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles in the holy city, shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. They tread the holy city forty and two months, three and a half years. Now, I do believe and I already know that the, that the Israeli government has been working for quite some time. The United Nations, the Vatican has been involved in this. The Vatican is definitely, I mean, I don't care if you don't like it, if I bring up the Vatican or not, i got to tell you just like it is because it was uh, none other than uh, uh, Cardinal uh, Jean, Jean Torrent who actually is calling that there must be a, a, uh, a, a independent governing, government, governing, governing body there to, to mandate the laws in Jerusalem. All right, Barry Chamish. Uh, it's d very disturbing for me that Barry passed away today. We actually shared the last interview we did with Barry in 2014 on our Israeli News Live Facebook page here. If you want to go look at that, he did. He passed away today. We got the news of that. Did a little short story on our website about it as well. Couldn't be enough words that could be said about Barry. He's a very candid individual, but he was an incredible investigative journalist. But Barry knows as well that this deal that was done between the Vatican and and between uh, Shimon Perez was the beginning that was set up to divide Jerusalem and to give Rome the old city. And 
believe me, Barry Chamish is not a conspiracy theorist, and he's not the kind of guy that, that, that just writes articles to write them. He was a well-known investigative journalist, uh, fled, had to leave Israel because of his own safety, because the things he would expose, especially in his latest novel, or his la one of, not his latest novel, but one of his earliest novels that made him very well known, and that was Who Assassinated, or Who Killed Yitzhak Rabin, or Assassinated Yitzhak Rabin. Um, at any rate, though, let's get back to this right here, what we're looking at here. So, they're going to tread the city underfoot for 40 and two months, for three and a half years. And the same time they're given that city for three and a half years, the two witnesses are coming on the scene at the exact same time. So when people think that, well, the Antichrist rules three and a half years, the two witnesses do three and a half years, and they each get their own three and a half years, according to Revelation 11:2, they're going at the exact same time. Because the two witnesses are coming on the scene at the exact same time that the Gentiles are given the holy city to tread under their feet for 40 and two months. It's not two different time periods, guys. It's right there. I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks before the God of the earth. That's written in the uh, the book of Zechariah. All right. So if you want to cross cross reference that, we're talking about the book of Zechariah. Now. Here's where the big issue comes when I bring up Moses every time. I never, it's the most quoted scripture of all, Moses died. What do you mean? He's got to, he, he, he don't have to come back again. Only Elijah and Enoch never died. They got to die. And they quote here, it is appointed unto men once to die. Hebrews 9, 27. I scratch my head over and over and over and over, and I think to myself, how many people quote the verse and know nothing about what is written in the book of Hebrews here? So I decided this time not to go through it anymore. Tell you straight up, we got to look at this for what the Word of God says and quit adding to the Word of God, all right? Nothing against, and God bless you, my brothers, sisters. I, I'm not against you that believe that Enoch would be one of the two witnesses, but what it is is when you're using that as, as the, uh, the stand there, maybe you just are not aware of what Hebrews 9 really says. Let's back up, though, to verse 24. The entire chapter is dealing with the way the sacrificial system was set up, the temple, the ordinances, the gifts, the offerings, everything, how Christ was a type of all of this, and how the priests had to go in every year in order to bear, uh, for the sins of the people and to offer sacrifice for the sins of the people. This is what happened. This is what happened in the wilderness journey. Uh, you know, whole long story. We already know all this. All right, that's, what, that's how it goes, starts off. But when you get down to verse 24, that's where I want to pick it up so you don't miss it. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the highest priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. All right, you're starting to see where they're going with it now, where, where they say Paul wrote it. I know there's different opinions on that. We'll just say Paul wrote it, all right? Notice again, verse 25, Nor yet that he, that's speaking of Yeshua, Jesus Christ, should offer himself often as the high priest entered in the holy place every year with blood of others. In other words, he doesn't have to die no more than once. For what? For a sacrifice. Okay? For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. All right. Now watch it now. And it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was offered to bear the sins of many, and, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin and the salvation. Now here's what's really nuts about all this. Why did the translators translate it men when they did that? The entire time in verse 24 to 26 and all the verses above is speaking about one man, and that is Yeshua. Only one man that would offer his life to die. It's not speaking of 
mankind. All right, but let me show you something so you see what my point is. It comes, it is appointed unto men, G444, okay, that's Anthropos, once to die. Now, yes, it could be if you take the third, the very last usage of it in the plural, it could be for people. But guys, we're not looking, you're not looking anywhere on here of a plural illustration. You're looking at Yeshua himself, Jesus himself, as a single man coming in, giving his life. Him, everything is singular. All right? So when they translated and put men as a plural, that was wrong to do for the translators because the whole passage is in the singular. So why do they do it in the plural? All right? So let's look at it again. Anthropos. It is a human being, whether male or female, indefinitely someone, a man, one. It is a singular. And in the case that we are looking at here, with it all pertaining to Yeshua and what he did for, for the sins of the world, then it shouldn't be men. It should be, it should have said, and it is appointed unto, unto man wants to die. Okay, and, and notice on there too, guys. Let me show you something here. The word unto is not even in the Greek. It's just, it is appointed men wants to die. They add the word unto in there because it's not there. Okay? It's appointed, it's appointed man wants to die. Only one man. Because if you take it from a literal standpoint, if you really want to just take it literal, then that means that anybody that ever died and was raised again and died again weren't supposed to die again. They were supposed to go straight to the judgment. What are they doing here if they didn't go to the judgment? You understand? So the point is, is he came, he gave his life, he died once, and now the judgment follows. Okay? Nothing else. So Christ was once offered to bear the sin of many, and to them that look for him, he appears a second time without sin unto salvation. You understand now? So it has nothing to do with Moses. It has nothing to do with Enoch. In fact, if anything, people that believe the rapture to be true, and, the, and I do believe God is going to hide away a remnant, uh, I may differ with some people on timing, but I don't throw people under the bus on that. As everybody's got their own opinion on that. But the thing is, is if he's going to hide away somebody, and they're going to go up, and they're not going to taste death, and Paul even writes that himself, then when are they supposed to come back, back and die again? If they've never died, if they're never going to taste death, and the funny thing is, is, the people that believe this type of doctrine to begin with are the ones that say you can, you, 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 you got to come back and die. So when, when does all the ones that are raptured away, when do they come back and die then? If, you, if you're keeping it literal the way you think it should be written. All right, so that's what I wanted to share with you. Get, let's get the nonsense out of the way. It is appointed into, into a, a man wants to die. That man was Christ Yeshua that that scripture is talking about. Not every man person walking along all right now so let's go back then and let's take a serious look at what it says here if we look at Moses uh, excuse me uh, I call it the one of the this is one of many there's many prophecies about Moses that is written in the Torah that never have been fulfilled many of them this is one example Exodus 34 10 and he said behold I make a covenant before all thy people, I will do marvels such as have not been done in all the earth nor in any nation, and all the people among which you are shall see the work of the Lord, for it is a terrible thing that I will do with thee. Okay? Now, the problem is, and, I, and I've got it written right here in the Hamash. I've showed it to you guys before. I won't take and do it right now. The Hamash clearly writes, maybe I should do it. The Hamash clearly writes about this verse here in their commentaries that you, we, this time we can't translate the word that way. I'm like, when I read that, I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Even Rashi states, based on Exodus 15, when Moses says, Asherah, Ladonai, Ga'aga'o, okay, I will sing unto the Lord. 
that he's gotten victory over the horse and his rider and he's cast him in or hurled him into the sea. Rashi says that it was written in the future tense, Moses sang it as if it has never been fulfilled as of yet. And so Rashi concluded that undoubtedly Moses has to come back and that he would come back during the Messianic age. Okay, rabbis, if you believe that, you believe Rashi's words on that, then why would you take Exodus 34 and verse 10 here and decide it doesn't belong? Because it doesn't fit the doctrine that you believe it should be. Okay? So, here's what they do right here. I'm going to share that with you. i got to do it with the camera, guys, so you can see this here. Let me make sure I get it on the right side here. I'm sorry, guys. Yes. All right. There you go, right there. Distinctions. Take your cam or your video and pause it and read it. All right? That way you can see it. Come back and read it. I want you to read it, but I'm going to read it to you now. Okay? They take the word nifalot, which is, they call it, they translate it distinctions. The word cannot mean wonders as it usually does because the future history of the nation did not shower greater miracles than God had done in Egypt and at the Sea of Reeds. That's according to Ramban. That just goes to show you how many, Ramban too, by the way, is from way back when too, all right? So Ramban and Rashi and all these guys, they all have different opinion. Rabbis, wake up. You don't have to go by what the sages say just because one has one opinion and the other one's got another opinion because none of their opinions match, okay? Stick with the Torah. Stick with the Tanakh. Stick with the Word of God with matches that don't have deviation. Jeez. You know, I'm not going to say the translators don't go in there and make a lot of mess out of things. Sure they do. All right, let's take a look at this, though. Seriously. The Yomad, all right, we're going to look at this in Hebrew as well now, all right? So let me take you right here. And he said, Behold, I make a covenant before all thy people I will do marvels, such as have not been done in all the earth, all right? Call amcha ose nifalot. All right, Nifalot is the word for wonders. It's an incredible miracle, right? Call Amcha, all your people. That's your singular right there, Amcha, am people. Oso, I uh, say, Nifalot. He's going to do incredible wonders, right? Asha lo Nibaru. Now that is powerful, all right? Because what are you looking at here? I, or he's going to do the marvel, such as not have been done in all the earth. Now, they translate that, things that have not been done. But you know what he says right there? I shall lo. That's not, or no, have not. I shall, which, which have, you can say I shall is which have, which have not. Ni baru, which have not been created. So this time around, when the man comes with the rod in his hand, not only is it going to be great wonders, it's going to be creation as well. All right? Now, continuing on, Bekol Ha'aretz, and all the earth, it's going to create with this staff. And let me say something else too while I'm on it. I want to really straighten this out right now. I get so many people, I've seen this for years and years and years, people that go around that say, thus saith the Lord. Okay? Thus saith the Lord. And then they'll tell you this and this, and they said, you know, if I say thus saith the Lord, then you know that's God speaking and not me. No. If you ever hear anybody going around and telling you in the English language, thus saith the Lord, and then they tell you something that God says, I can guarantee you one thing, that is not the way God does it. The word Lord in there is all caps, L-O-R-D. It is God's divine name, yod Hey vav He. There's one man that knows how to say it. And when he comes, he'll say it then. Then you will hear ka o And then his divine name. yod he vav -he. When you see that, that is a real, thus saith the Lord. Everything else, it's not the real deal. God's divine name is creative within itself. And when his name can be spoke, creation will be brought. That is why, lo nibarau bekol ha'aretz. Wait till you hear then, kaomer. And it won't be said without being said. 
And I know a lot of people probably take offense to that, but I, I got to tell you like it is because I see it all the time. People say, well, that's thus saith the Lord. You know how many thus saith the Lord has never happened? It's sickening. All right. Kol ha'am ashar. Okay. And all the people which which all the people that you are dwelling dwelling with, et ma'osei yod hey vav hey. We'll just say Adonai. And some people are just, oh no, it's, it's Yahweh. It's, you know, or, or, or brother so-and-so knows that it was this or that. God says in the book of Zephaniah that when Israel is compassed about with armies, then the divine name will be restored that all the people may be able to call upon the name of the Lord. Okay? So, and this is what we're seeing in Zechariah as well. I mean, Micah. Micah is showing you that when Moses comes with Elijah, it's going to be right after this huge deal that's going on in Syria right now with the refugee crisis. It's coming right after that time period. At the timing also of the Third Temple, when they're given over the, the Jerusalem uh, for three and a half years for them to go walking on, that's when your two witnesses come walking in. Okay. So anyway, Ki nore hu ashar ani ose imcha. All right? For it is a... Uh, all right, watch here. He says, which thou art shall see the work. See, uh, that which they will see. Noe who asha ani ose imcha. What I'm going to do with you. So it says it again, like it was with Moses in the beginning when God was doing all those works. He's going to do it again. Now, I want to prove to you about this part about creation, though, the bra. So I put it back here again for you right here. Asha lo ni barahu arts. Okay? Therefore, see, He's going to do what? He's going to create. He's going to create. It's, just, it's not just what you think it is. It's creation. So what do we have here in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1? Barashit bara Elohim et ha-shemayim ve-et ha-aretz. See? Lo ni bara'u. I'm using the bara's right here in the middle. The underlined part right there. The word create. He's going to do things. He's going to create things that he ain't never done before. That's how, that's how amazing this is going to be, guys. Amazing indeed. All right, back to Micah again, verse 17. They shall lick the dust like serpents. They shall move out of their holes like worms of the earth. They shall be afraid of the Lord our God and shall fear because of thee. Who? Because the little guy with a stick in his hand? And you know, <laughs> they're definitely in the holes of the earth. Their little caves, everything else. I wonder why God says they'll, they'll come out of the holes like worms. Like, see, move out of their holes like worms of the earth. They shall be afraid of the Lord our God and shall fear because of you. Who is a God, God likened unto you? What that, now watch this, who went here, that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgressions of the remnant of his heritage. He retaineth not his anger forever, because he delighteth in mercy. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities, and thou will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Thou will perform the truth of Jacob and mercy unto Abraham. Thou hast sworn unto the fathers from days of old. What are the two witnesses doing, guys? They are bringing Israel to the Messiah, to introduce them to their Messiah. Israel's redemption. Notice verse 17 again. Who is God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by transgression of the remnant of his heritage? Doesn't that remind you of Daniel 9, 24, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people, upon thy holy city, to do what? To finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity. Interesting, isn't it? The similarities. Now, I put this in here just to make an important note here. If you go to Exodus chapter 3 and you begin to read, remember how God speaks to Moses? I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt. I know their sorrows. I come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land and to a good land and a large and to a land flowing with milk and honey. I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Now everything is I, the personal pronoun, God speaking to Moses. And then watch what he says. Come now therefore and I will send you unto Pharaoh. 
that you may bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. So it's no strange coincidence when we look at Micah chapter 7 and we see after the refugee crisis of Assyria and northwest uh, Iraq that this guy with the staff comes in and he is coming in to bring about a judgment against Israel's enemies. And at the same time, he's going to introduce them to their Messiah. That's exactly what I'm seeing there as I look at that myself. Exodus chapter 3, verse 8, And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of the land unto a good land and a large unto a land flowing with milk and honey unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Is that right? Now here's what's interesting. God promised that with Moses in Exodus 3.8. He swore he'd be using. Remember, we started off in Exodus 34, verse 10, and I showed you what God said he was going to do with Moses and these great miracles that never happened. Remember, guys, not only was he going to do miracles, but he was going to create, and it was greater than anything he'd ever done. And that's clear over in Exodus 34. Moses, back all the way back there in the beginning of Exodus there, everything that happened, the, the plagues, the Red Sea, parting of the Red Sea, all that, that's going to look like nothing compared to what he's supposed to do this time around or what he was supposed to do. But according to the rabbis and what I showed you a moment ago in the Hamash, they said, well, it must be a different word because he never did anything greater, an unfulfilled prophecy. They don't want to say it's an unfulfilled, unfulfilled prophecy. They just want to say, this time we won't translate the word Nephilot the same way we did in other times. Notice verse 11 in Exodus 34. Observe thou that which I command thee this day. Behold, I drive out before thee the Amorite and the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. God said he'll drive them out. Over here, we thought this was fulfilled during the time of Moses. But remember, God said to Moses, I come down. I am going, to, I see the affliction. I'm going to deliver my people. I'm going to take them to a land of milk and honey. And to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, and the Moimorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. All those names there are sitting right here. Did Joshua drive them all out? No, he didn't. Joshua ben Nun didn't do it. Observe that, that which I command thee this day. Behold, I drive out before you the Amorite, the Canaanite, etc. Looks like he's doing it. He's doing it as we speak. Those lands are becoming desolate. may happen in the rest of Israel as well. I never thought about it like that. Malachi chapter 4 in closing. Remember ye the law. Now this is what's funny. <laughs> this is when it speaks about Elijah coming, right? Verse 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Couldn't have been John the Baptist. He was Elijah too. Remember that? Jesus said he was. Couldn't have been Elijah himself back then. The dreadful day never happened back then. And there are several organizations of today that claim that their leader was the Elijah of Malachi 4-5. But they've come and gone. They've been buried for many years in all, the, in all the cases that I'm aware of except for all the modern-day Elijahs that are out there now that are telling us they're Elijah for today. There's a lot of those, too. By the way, if you don't believe me, I guarantee you, I don't know if all of them have ever contacted me, but I've had a lot of Elijahs call me, email me, whatever the case, not called by telephone, but they've emailed me. And for those of you that do email that tell me that you're Elijah, I just want you to know you got a lot of competition because if you email me and say you're Elijah, there's about another mm, six, seven of you out there besides yourself. Same for Moses. I get a lot of Moses has called me too. Email me. Let me clarify that. 
But notice what Malachi says before he speaks about the coming of Elijah. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and the judgments. He speaks of them together, just like he does in Revelation 11 when he speaks about their ministries, the turning of the water to blood, the fire out of heaven. Elijah, you know, calls the fire, it devours the servants. Moses turns the water to blood. Then they both can do plagues of all sorts. Uh, we find out, according to Revelation 11, the two candlesticks that are there. And uh, we also see the two candlesticks as well. Uh, when we're looking at that, of course, over in Zechariah's prophecy, the two olive trees standing on either side of the golden lampstand, remember that in Zechariah. And then we get a beautiful display of that when Yeshua appears on Mount Transfiguration and Moses and Elijah standing on either side of the golden menorah. Yeshua is that golden menorah. He's standing there, and there on either side of him are the two olive trees. And sitting in Israel today, on the Mount of Olives, two olive trees, not too far apart from one another, and they're both over 2,000 years old. Tell me the irony of that. And again, we see Moses and Elijah together in the book of Malachi. But what's really cool, though, is when you look at Moses here, God asked you to remember him and what he commanded unto him at Horeb, not Mount Sinai. Now, Sinai is when we get the other laws. Now, Horeb is when you get only the Ten Commandments and two statutes. Maybe God's trying to bring us into remembrance of something here, guys. Remember, Revelation says they have the testimony of Jesus or Yeshua, that is, and they keep his commandments. Maybe it's just those commandments right there from Mount Horeb. It's not the 600 and something that are out there from Mount Sinai. I'm Stephen Benoon. You've been watching a prophetic segment of Israeli News Live. I trust it's a blessing. If you want to look for this and other videos similar to this, if you look on our Israeli News Live YouTube channel here and go down at the very bottom of the main part of our page there, we have sections on all types of subjects there. We have one called the Two Witnesses. We'll file this one in there with the rest of them there so you can see all the different messages that are about that. I'm Stephen Benoon with Israeli News Live. Prophetic segment. Shalom.